So I, I promised you a Thanksgiving tea. I'll give it. Uh, it's uh, so come on down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is uh, our own Professor Arno, uh, who has been the head of the Microparticles Photophysics Lab. Uh, and uh, what you're going to hear today is uh, about a wonderful uh, biosensor that was invented, designed, developed here at Poly. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm not brave enough to talk about it, but Professor Arno is Right. Well, so many people. <laughs> Evgeny, you didn't say you had such a large class. This is larger than I expected. So uh, what I've come to talk to you about is sort of a journey that I made in trying to detect, uh, to create a biosensor. And I created it because of the death of a friend of mine uh, who uh, unfortunately died of complications from a viral infection. So that motivated this whole thing. And what went on since then is, is basically um, a device which has led to 5,000 research publications. Not from us, but all around the place. So, um, so I've titled this NYU Poly's Ultra Sensitive Whispering Gallery Mode Biosensor because we basically conceived it here. Rockefeller University helped to demonstrate some of it, and more was demonstrated here. This is the logo for the laboratory called the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory. And I wanted to make this, when it was designed, an east-west logo. Okay? So where is the east? What is that thing? Anyone? Really? What is it? It is the Chinese symbol for light. Yeah, exactly. Don't worry. These international people, they're going to love it, this whole thing. <laughs> you shouldn't worry about that. And, uh, and they are going to need to know what NYU is, OK? So this is not something I would normally do in a classroom here, but, um, but I think. So it was important to do here. I mean, they have to know that we come from where? New York. New York. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I wanted to tell you about the motivation. I don't know if you've ever read any books by this guy. Isaac Asimov. He's the one who wrote iRobot. He also wrote 515 books of average length, 300 pages each. Can you imagine? It sounds impossible somehow. But unfortunately, he required open heart surgery, which was elective, meaning he, you know, the doctor said, you need this. And he went in, and he needed transfusions. So this was in the 80s. They gave him transfusions. But there was HIV in the blood transfusion. So later on, about 10 years later, he developed AIDS, and that led to complications which led to his death. So good reason to try to detect the virus, right? And there wasn't anything then, and so we decided we would design a way to detect virus. We would detect them down to one at a time, one viral particle at a time, none of this ensemble stuff, right? And we'd also try to figure out a way to actually measure their size by using the sensor. So now we're talking about a sensor that can possibly act as a size spectrometer as well. And um, that's what this talk is really all about. So it's about pathogens. Those things which, when they get into you, make you sick, right? 
And we're interested in pathogens now. So it turns out that when people used to get ulcers, that happened, and then stomach cancer, they thought that was due to frustration. Yeah, they say, hey, you're frustrated, you got this. But the reality was that it was due to this bacterium. That's a pathogen. Um, this is the Helicobacter pylori bacterium. It's, it's about three microns long. Obviously, a large object, well, small by our, you know, by our standards of length, you know, the length of our thumbs or something. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in something that size. So compare it to this. That's the size of an HIV virus. It's about a tenth of one micrometer, okay? And if, and if I blow it up by 35 times, that's what it looks like. So there's a lot of machinery in there, genomic as well as other machinery. There's even a capsid covering the thing. And there are these epitopes sticking out from it. It's 600 atograms, atogram being 10 to the minus 18 grams, whereas this is 3 million atograms, so much smaller. And then the protein, those things which need to be essentially capped off by antibodies in order for keeping this stuff from getting into a cell, those things are even smaller. They're a tenth of an atogram. So we're going to try to detect each of these one at a time. Ultimate sensitivity. Okay, no compromise. The, the problem is that you need a philosophy for detection. You can't just uh, you know, start off, I'm going to detect it. So what we did was basically shut down the laboratory and try to figure out a way to do this. Before that, however, I had a discussion with this man, Joshua Lederberg, who was from uh, Rockefeller University, who claimed that the virus is now the biggest threat to our planet. No politician, right? A virus. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and it turns out viral particles are being detected and cataloged by the National Institute of Health starting in 1994 because they realize bacterium kind of infections, that's sort of old hat from the last century. Now it's all about virus. And they're disease vectors for all kinds of things. Okay. Women understand this because of the various vaccines that are available for various things. Also, men understand this for other vaccines and so on and so forth. The question is, how would you possibly detect them? And, uh, and, and here was the great puzzle, you know, you, you know, what do you do to try to detect these? Well, you need some kind of philosophy. My philosophy was I didn't believe molecular spectroscopy was the right way to go. I say, you know, forget that. I'm not going to look at the signature that light gives because proteins are large things, right? They're complicated. Well, I don't want to read this whole thing, but you give you a feeling for it. For example, in a sensitized person, an allergic reaction to certain toxic proteins on the surface a pollen causes specific antibody to engulf the invading allergen like a lock covering the key. Okay, that's how, that's how your system detects the allergen, right? It does it biologically, right? So you don't have to do all that spectroscopy. Maybe if you had to do that, nature would have put light inside your body, right? But it hasn't. So if we mimic biology, we recognize bioparticles through dark interactions. And by that I mean the following. Things like this. Antibodies to detect virus. Oligos to detect hybridization with complementary oligos. 
And you could even think about non-specific sort of things that reverse the charge of a surface and allow things to accumulate on the surface. So, after taking on the philosophy, there was a question, right, that occurs, you know, okay, fine, but suppose something comes to a surface and these things are there and they cling to it. That doesn't mean you're going to detect it, right? That just simply means something clung to the surface. How do you detect something? You need to transduce. You need to uh, have something say it got there, right? And if we're not going to use any fluorescence, and we're not going to use any absorption spectroscopy, we got to co <laughs> go with something else. And by the way, the, this, this, this way we're going to do it is called label-free. Okay, we are going to put something on the surface that's sticky, makes these things come, come there and stick. And that's the way it identifies them. But we're not going to label the analyte. So I, I was sitting watching, uh, there's a wonderful place in New York City called the 92nd Street Y where they have, uh, you know, recitals. This guy, uh, Yitzhak Perlman, was playing the violin, right? And uh, I was listening to him play and wondering what would happen if a dust particle landed on the string. So, I only need one volunteer. What do you think would happen? Yes? Uh, it's why the way will change. The what will change? The voice, you, you mean the tone? Yeah, yeah, the tone, yeah. yeah. I guess that's exactly what would happen. The tone would change. Well, okay, so that gave some idea. Maybe I could measure the frequency with which it oscillates after a dust particle, right, gets on it. Okay, so this, this is a frequency spectrum. You know, when you look at your iPhone, you know, every time you bring up some music, you see a frequency spectrum. Well, this is the frequency spectrum of a violin string, right? So there's a spectrum. And after something clings to the surface, that little delta M there, the spectrum will shift. So if I could measure the shift, that would be great. There's a little problem. Before I get into the problem, let me tell you what I would ex be expecting from this. I'd expect the shift to be larger than the width of the line. Otherwise, I'm not going to see it, right? It's got to move enough. And I can write that as the shift divided by the frequency times the frequency divided by the line width. This, this is sort of what comes from the transduction, the shift. This factor, omega over the line width, comes from dissipation. Okay, so one thing has to do with transduction, the other one has to do with dissipation. Dissipation changes the width of that line. Okay, need another volunteer. What do you suppose may be the problem in using violin to detect a virus? Yes? The string is too big for one virus that comes on. String is too big, yeah. Well, in the case of these kind of things, they're kind of inertial. So the string, the string has too large a mass. It, it, that's exactly the right answer. So it, it turns out that the shift in frequency divided by the original frequency is the mass of the thing that falls divided by the original mass. But a virus has a mass of 10 to the minus 16 grams. And a violin string has a mass of 10 grams. That's a change in, of a part in 10 to the 17th. However, the line here is only a, the line here is a part in a hundred. <laughs> You're never going to see this thing shift by one part in 10 to the 17th. It's ridiculous. But it was a thought, right? It was something that you could think about. So I wanted to teach you one little principle here, really important. It's a, it's a, the, the principle is this. This is that line width measured when you 
do it in the frequency domain. The way you do frequency domain is you shake this plate at a certain frequency, and then what happens is this thing begins to take on energy, right? And you measure this width. But there's also another way to get equivalent information. You could, you could simply bang on the string and watch it slowly decay away, right, the amplitude. Turns out the product of the line width times that time to decay away is one. It's a very, okay. So if you want something with an incredibly narrow line width, you want something which will decay away after being hit by a hammer in a very, very, very long time. An analysis of the violin strings showed that once you pluck that string, in order for it to be sensitive to virus, the decay time would have to be 30,000 years. It's kind of ridiculous, right? It doesn't make any sense. So that's not going to work. You want something that rings for a very long time after it's hit with a hammer. What does that? A system with very little dissipation. Yet people still believe in violin strings. I mean, the, the place which is considered a, one of the best engineering places in the entire world, right? C California Institute of Technology created this violin string. It's two millionths of a meter long. It was created by lithography, nanolithography. When you pluck it, it vibrates. And they did it to detect mass of viruses, protein, and things like that. What's wrong with this? We, we, want, we want our device to operate in body fluids. We want it to operate in urine. We want it to operate in blood. We want it to operate in saliva, right? What's wrong with this? I'll take a volunteer. Yes? Um, those fluids would affect the way that it's vibrating? Yeah, so what do you think it would do? It would have different vibration. Well, you, do you think that it would, uh, it, so if you started it vibrating, you think it would damp down quickly? Yeah. As if it had a shock absorber on it, right? All right. That's exactly right. I'm not, I'm not going to give any terrible words about this because this is going to be on a video, right? But I, I would say that this $3 million project sponsored by DARPA is in fact the wrong approach to actually detecting body fluids directly, okay? It's a very bad idea if that was what the intent was. Okay, so Q is a really important thing. Q defines that line width, right? It is the frequency divided by the line width. You want Q to be very large. So we discuss some Qs, right? The thorax of an insect. Q of 2.5. So why does an insect have such a low Q? That means that whatever he you know, like a cricket, it makes a chirp. It has to disappear very quickly, right? Vi the vibration has to end very quickly. Well, obviously the cricket's lifetime is not very long, right? He doesn't have time for the mating call if, if the chirp is gonna last 30,000 years, right? He hasn't got an opportunity whatsoever, right? So you, so this is exactly why nature defines, made him this way, right? Integrated circuit filter Q of 20, mechanical wristwatch between 100 and 300, surface acoustic waves 2000, a pendulum in air 10 to the fourth, quartz crystal 10 to the sixth. The watches that people wear on their wrists that they buy in the subway for a buck and a half, or you go to Canal Street and get them for three bucks, right? They're based on quartz crystals. 
the vibration of a quartz crystal. The mechanical wristwatch is a Rolex. The Rolex cost $8,000. Q stabilizes watches, makes them more constant. So why would you pay $8,000 over $1 to buy something that's not as accurate, right? The answer is, it's eye candy, right? What's eye candy? It's like a gold filling in your teeth, right? It's eye candy. People buy it for fashion. But if anybody's wearing that and tells you it's accurate, you just walk away from them. Optical microcavities. This is another class of things. It's an optical object that can contain light over a long period. But the problem here is, can it operate in a solution? Okay, so it turns out the first experiment ever done was done at Poly on, it was a discovery a small bead, 15 millionths of a meter in radius, was put onto the surface of an optical fiber that had been shaved down. When, when you shave down an optical fiber, you expose something called the evanescent field on the outside of it. That evanescent field, when the laser was tuned, was causing a spectrum that looked like the spectrum of an atom. So the guy looking that was my eye, actually, but it, I don't look like that. So <laughs> looking through here was seeing the light blinking every time it went into one of these resonances. And it was recorded over here. So apparently there's something about that little s solid, effectively, piece of polystyrene that in fact makes it resonate, makes it oscillate. So why does it work? Well, it turns out the, the external light was creating this. Light was held by a total internal reflection on the inside of that sphere. And total internal reflection, at least on a flat surface, has no losses. Obviously, in a curved surface, is somewhat different. Now, here's where we're going to talk about a little physics. This is, you could call this a ray point of view, right? Rays. But you could also call it a photon point of view, as if a photon were skipping around there, a particle of light. Anytime you have a picture like this, you have the equivalence of a picture like that. This is called the wave-particle duality. To go into resonance, it meant that the wave was biting its own tail. When it did that, just as in hydrogen, it went into resonance. Okay, that's really important. The order of the resonance, people talk about that, is the number of wavelengths around the outside. Here there are many. That's why it was working. So the question really is, what is the large delta omega, or what is the large delta wavelength? How big would it be? Okay. Well, began to think about this. So here's that wave contained within that little sphere. And what we're going to do now is we're going to deposit on its surface some protein. It turns out protein has about the same refractive index as silica, glass. There's the protein. This is in a, a particular order, meaning a certain number of wavelengths around the outside. What will happen after we deposit the protein is that the orbit's going to grow outward because it looks like you just made the sphere larger. So that the effect of wavelength circulating is going to be larger than it was before. 
And as a result of that, every one of those resonances we saw before in that thing that looked like an atomic thing, right, atomic spectrum, will shift. So it turns out it's not very hard to work out what this change in wavelength is compared to this wavelength. You've got two similar triangles. So you just take some ratios. So the shift in the wavelength to the original wavelength is the same as the thickness of the layer deposited divided by the radius of the original sphere. Well, what it meant is once you write this down, it means you can estimate the thickness based on a certain wavelength shift. You just have to solve for thickness. Here it is. Now, suppose we, we, we required that this thing shift by one line width. Well, then all we would do is substitute for the shift one line width. Well, it turns out a line width divided by the wavelength is just one over the Q. And the Q was already measured for these things to be t between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 7. I took an intermediate Q of 10 to the 6th, divided it into a 10 micron radius, and got 10 to the minus 11 meters. Now, I guess we have to have some realization of what that is. OK, so question to you. What is the diameter of hydrogen? Anybody have any idea? Right, he's a shill. I, I was kind of <laughs> One angstrom, but you got to tell us in meters. Okay, so 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 to the minus 10 meters. That's uh, Mohammed over here. So a tenth of that is 10 to the minus 11. So what this was saying is, not only could we detect a layer of things, but they could be a tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. This, right, amazing. Okay, it's amazing what you can get out of simple math in this case. So the question really that comes up is, is there any com competition for this? About 10 years ago, General Electric bought a company from the northern part of Europe by the name of Biacor. Biacor had invented the surface plasmon resonance detector, which can detect antibody-antigen interactions. It never has measured a single protein or anything like that, but still, it's the standard. They paid a whopping $400 million for that company 10 years ago. How does this compare to that? Note, note here that we said that we would shift by one line width in 10, over here, 10 to the minus 11 meters, but a protein is on the order of 3 nanometers in size. So what is the ratio of the size of a protein to the size of 10 to the minus 11 meters? Well, if we went all the way up to nanometers, we'd be going up a factor of 100. And if we up to 3 nanometers, we'd go up a factor of 300. So let's see what the response of the surface plasmon detector is. This is for a full layer of protein. The shift is only one line width. Ours would have shifted by 300 line widths. So the conclusion is simple. It takes a layer of 3 nanometers thick to cause a shift of one angular line width here. That makes the WGM, the Whispering Gallery Mode, device 300 times more sensitive than surface plasma and polariton. No wonder that there are several companies now uh, uh, dedicated to to basically developing these WGM sensors. Can we make it all photonic? In other words, this idea of looking with your eyes, you know, or, or scattering coming off the edge of something, well, you don't want to do that, right? This shows uh, something called a distributed feedback laser. I have to tell you how long it is. It's on the order of a fraction of a millimeter long, very small, right? The sphere over here, the one we were talking about before, is even smaller than that, 
Remember, 10 micrometer radius. So I've had to exaggerate to show you this. When you change the current through the DFB laser, distributed feedback laser, you, you can stimulate that resonance. And when you do, you create a dip in the light coming to the power detector. So you see directly what's going on, and you don't really have to let any light out. I mean, you, you can just put this right up against that. The whole thing is very compact and much, much, much smaller than the size of an iPhone. This was originally, uh, this implementation of the DFB was made by Griffel and myself and others. In, uh, in the late 90, 1996 period. So, having, having done all this, and I, I, I began to think about what the next step was. After all, the interest was in detecting virus. I began to think, you know, what are we going to do? We, we don't have any, at that time, microfabrication here at Poly. So, a young student, a fellow who had taken my, uh, an honors course I was giving, came to my office and he says, well, you need microfluidics. I said, we don't have the, you know, the capability of that here. So, but you need it. Okay, I said, what do you, what do you propose? He said, go to this URL. Okay, I could see that it was um, eBay. I went in, looked, and it was a little milling machine. The milling machine had end mills that were very, very small. I said to him, this thing has motorized XYZ. Do you know how to run it? He said, no, but get me a book, okay, and, uh, and buy me this thing. I said, how much is it? With computer, $600. So I took my credit card out and figured, well, it's probably a good investment in the next grant, you know, and paid for it, and, and it came. And he began to sleep in the lab until he got it all done, and within a month, I had microfluidics as good as anybody else's at the time. And here you see this microfluidic cell made out of PDMS, there's the micro cavity, which he stuck in here. He also made digital pumps so he could send the virus in and fluid. And here's that uh, DFB laser that comes through here with a fiber and so on. And um, I had to present this in, uh, in England at the Faraday discussions of the Royal Society. And, and you can see he did a great deal. His name was David Kang. Then we had a problem. David didn't know any chemistry to speak of, and, and we needed to functionalize the surface of that microcavity. So we hired on a chemical engineering student who had just gotten his PhD, and he created in one, two, three, four, five steps. He first put a silane compound onto the silica, so it would bond. He then opened up the bonds. A lot of steps later, he added the antibody for one virus. The virus was MS2, something we could handle in the lab because it wouldn't infect anybody. There it is. It's really small, 25 nanometers across. This is something similar in size but slightly larger called Phi X174. And what happened next was that he took his apparatus, added the antibody for MS2, injected the, the MS2 virus. When he injected the MS2 virus, the wavelength began to shift because many viruses came to the surface and clung on to these antibodies. And then when he tried to wash off the virus with some PBS, right, with buffer solution, it wouldn't come off. So that sounded good. When he went to the Phi X174, which has a different genetic makeup, still using the same antibody, 
They even clung harder to the surface, or at least more of them did. But in fact, as soon as the PBS came in, they were all gone. So he demonstrated the, for the first time this ability to distinguish between them using one of these micro cavities. Then he began to ask, can single virus be detected? The, the whole idea was that we weren't going to be satisfied uh, in, in this quest with simply detecting a layer of virus. We wanted to detect single virus and we actually wanted to measure their size. Now, if a virus particle comes in and you've got photons circulating around in a polygon like this on the inside, there's an evanescent field on the outside which begins to polarize the virus. And we came up with a sensing principle. The photonic energy in the cavity changes, which means the frequency changes, by the energy required to polarize the virus. This took about two months to work, out, work through electromagnetics to get this little principle in that many words. But what does it imply? The answer is, well, if you start with something like this and a virus is coming in and lands somewhere on the surface of that sphere, okay, you expect a frequency shift, especially if it lands at the equator where the light is circulating. And what our calculations showed that we should be able to detect a tenth of an HIV virus if we could make resonators which were only 40 millionths of a meter in radius and make them out of silica, glass, and also operate at a short, a short wavelength. That's short for us. So we, we put together this thing over a period of a month or so and asked, does it work? And it turned out before we got done with it, a former student of mine who I supervised at Rockefeller wanted to do it, he read the paper. And so he set up this most elegant thing. He just simply took an O-ring, stuck it down on a piece of glass, and then put a droplet of liquid in, creating a hemisphere of liquid, and he said, well, that's my microfluidic cell. It's static. Then he injected with a syringe into that various virus particles, and in this case it was influenza, influenza we could handle, especially at Harvard where he was, because it was killed influenza. And uh, he began to immediately see steps in the wavelength shift. He was detecting them one at a time. More importantly than that, I guess, was when I took that sensing principle and applied it, I could get a radius of the, the virus based on the wavelength shift of the light that was measured actually the fractional wavelength shift, and notice it was 1.5 parts in 10 to the eighth. That's over here. And when we were all done, created this equation, we got 47 nanometers for the radius of the influenza virus. The only peop th people, only thing people knew from SEM, scanning electron microscopy, is that it was between 45 and 55. So we were right in that ballpark. Apparently, we had created something that could act as a size spectrometer. And all this time, patents were being filed on from the Polytechnic until about six or seven of them got filed on different aspects of this. More I'll show you to cover us as we were doing it. Then what happened was I, I took measurements from around the world done at different wavelengths for different size particles that were known, at least the mean size was known, and I computed what this RSP, this is called reactive sensing principle, that was the principle told me, and you notice that there's a slope of one, meaning it agrees. So now we can detect influenza, HIV, polio, polio is harder, but we, as hard as we tried, we weren't able to do MS2 one virus at a time. So our goal was not quite fulfilled. But then there was a challenge that came from MIT and, and University of California, Santa Barbara, 